The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. chapter 4, starting in verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. He was already in the boat, so they started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm arose. High waves began to break into the boat until it was nearly full of water. Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Frantically, they woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you even care that we are going to drown? So he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the water, Quiet down. And suddenly the wind stopped. and There was a great calm. And he asked them, Why are you so afraid? Do you still not have faith in me? And they were filled with awe and said among themselves, Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Every summer Hollywood comes out with what they would dub to be their Hollywood blockbuster or their summer blockbuster hit. And back in the year 2003, that big summer movie was... Uh, The first of the series called The Pirates of the Caribbean, this particular one was entitled The Curse of the Black Pearl. And and, uh, in this movie, there was a line where the villain, uh, the villain captain of the Black Pearl, Barbosa, turns to one of the other characters in the movie and he makes this statement. You're off the edge of the map, mate. Here there be monsters. I don't have a really good pirate's accent, but that's the line anyway. I thought it was an interesting line. And come to find out this line is, wasn't unique to this movie. This, this quote, this line that was pulled here is actually hundreds of years old. In uh, a British museum in London, there's an old mariner's chart that was drawn in 1525. So a long time ago, 1525, and it outlined the North American coastline. And the the cartographer who created the map did so from information that he probably gleaned from some of the ocean-going crews of the day. And on it were notations of where reefs might be, where ports might be, the best ports would be. But there were certain sections of this map that were left relatively 
blank. And so maybe some unexplored areas or areas where crews had encountered some problems and they didn't really want to go back or the, so they, they would avoid those sections. And in some of those sections, not all of them, but some of them were notations like this. Here be giants, here be fiery scorpions, here be dragons. In other words, here there be monsters. And ever since man has began this process of going out into the ocean on big ships, there has been a little bit of a fear of the unknown, the unseen or the uncontrollable. We feel fear when we go out into the open sea where there's nothing and nobody that can really help us. And I'd ask you a question, but I already know the answer. Have you ever been afraid? I've been afraid a time or two in my life. Um, as a child, I can remember, uh, well, my friends would call it a, a fear of heights. I call it a healthy respect for gravity. But I can remember going to what was called Nakawick Days. It was the local carnival that our small town put on every year just to kind of celebrate the birth of our community or whatever it was. It used to be farmland until back uh, several decades ago, they built a big pulp mill in Nakawick and the town kind of boomed from that pulp mill. And so they would celebrate the birth of that town um, and they called it Nakawick Days. And there'd be rides and carnival games and they would have the Miss Nakawick pageant. There would be some concerts, some other things going on. But I loved the rides. And of course, there was the Ferris wheel and some of those ones that spin around and make me want to vomit all over the place. I can't do around and round things. Those teacups just make me sick looking at them. Um, but anyway, I can remember the one ride. Every teenager's dream ride, it was called the zipper. How many of you know what the zipper is? How many of you have been on the zipper? How many of you wouldn't dream of going on it because you're like me and scared of heights? <laughs> I can remember we were first in line and I wanted to be brave for my friends, but we were first in line, which meant you had the longest possible time on the ride because you had to wait while they loaded everybody else on. And it got to the point where we were all the way on the top and they were loading people on in the bottom and the friend that I was with in this little cage decided it would be fun to start rocking the thing. And I thought to myself, well, this is what the ride is supposed to do. It's supposed to go up and down and over and, and all of this stuff. And he got that thing rocking so fast that it actually went upside down before the ride ever stopped. And again, like I said, it's what the ride is supposed to do, so it's obviously safe enough to handle this type of treatment. Until I looked on the outside of that cage and realized that really the only thing holding that door closed was a little cotter pin. Because these, these fair rides that kind of come in and out of town really quickly... They're not the quality machinery you get at Disney World or something like that. And the bar that keeps you in the seat, you know, at Disney World, you have the big shoulder straps that come over and they keep you snug. And No, no, in the zipper, you have the little lap bar that just goes across. And I can remember, I was a scrawny little kid, and some might say some things don't really change a whole lot, but I can remember as that thing was going upside down, that I was almost out from under that little lap bar and about to roll around in the cage. And the, the bar really for me as a skinny little kid didn't hold any other value than maybe providing me something that I can hang on to before I fall to death. I was scared. And I think Probably most of us can say a time or two in our lives, maybe it wasn't at a fair, but maybe there was something, some circumstance, some situation that happened in your life where you can say, you know what, I was scared. And maybe you're in a place right now, it doesn't have to be a physical place, maybe it's a spiritual place, maybe it's an emotional place, maybe it's a financial place, but you can say, I'm a little afraid. Everybody explains or experiences fear from time to time. And it's, it's kind of normal, and it's even practical at times. And here in Mark chapter 4, we find Jesus asking a very interesting question. He says to the disciples, why are you so afraid? I'll skip ahead because I didn't post. Why are you so afraid? Throughout Jesus' ministry, people were always asking him questions, right? 
Well, oftentimes, Jesus would take those opportunities and turn them around, make them a teachable moment, and he would ask people questions. He asked a crippled man, what would you have me do for you? He asked the Pharisees, how will you escape the fires of hell? He asked Peter, who do people say the Son of Man is? And here in Mark chapter 4, he turns to the disciples in an absolute moment of distress and asks them, why are you so afraid? So here's kind of the background. Jesus has been spending some time preaching and sharing parables to the crowds that had gathered around him. And evening came, and he turned to the disciples, and he told them that it was time to leave, to go to the next place, to do the next thing. And so they all get out into the boat. And about halfway across the Sea of Galilee, this terrible storm de de descends on them, and the winds begin to blow, and the waves begin to break upon their ship, and they begin to take on a lot of water. In fact, there's so much water coming into the boat that these men are afraid that they might sink. And back in the stern of the boat is Jesus. And Jesus isn't just sitting there, somehow he's asleep. The Bible says his head was even on a cushion. And there didn't seem to be anything that could wake him up. And the disciples couldn't understand this. And in fact, the Bible says, it doesn't come right out and say it, but it seems to indicate that they started to get a little angry. And they asked the question, waking him up, don't you care that we're going to drown? Notice that he didn't say we might drown. We're going to drown. We are going down with the ship. It was even more of a question. It was more like a statement. And Jesus gets up and he calms the winds and the waves. And he asks, why are you so Afraid. Now, it strikes me as a, what strikes me as unusual about this is that it would seem to me that the disciples had every reason to be afraid. See, most of these men, not all of them, but most of them were experienced sailors. They spent their lives on open waters fishing. When these men got scared of a storm, you can pretty well bet that they had good reason. But Jesus asked them, why are you so afraid? Now that puzzled me because fear, in my understanding of fear, it's not always a bad thing. You know, as, as children grow up, we teach them to, to fear certain things. We might say, now son... Before you cross the street, make sure you look both ways. Well, why, Dad? Because if you don't, then a car might not see you, and when you step out, you might get hit. Well, what are we trying to teach them? We're trying to teach them to fear or to understand what might happen if you're not careful with certain things or if you don't pay attention. Or, honey, don't ever go swimming alone. Well, why? Because... If you go swimming alone and something happens, nobody will be there to help you and you might drown. Or don't stick the fork in the electrical socket. Normally we don't get the why question there. We just run over and yank the child away from the wall screaming. Why? Because fear is a practical thing from time to time. And not only is it practical on occasion, but God tells us that we are supposed to fear at least one thing, and that is Him. Book of Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 10 27, the fear of the Lord add, adds length to life. And of course, in the New Testament, Peter tells us, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Now, there's some who have been uncomfortable with the idea of fearing God and what that means. Some would dumb it down a little bit to say fearing God really just means to show God respect. And I would urge you, don't be deceived. That's not what it means. 
I received this lesson relatively early on in my ministry. I can remember before I had even graduated, I was just in my first year of university and I was volunteering at a church alongside of a pastor there. And this didn't happen at this church, but he told me a story of something that had happened to him at the former church that he was employed. And he said, over time it came out that the senior pastor of the church where he was working was engaging in a, in a homosexual affair. And Ken began to put these things together and he, came, and he told me, he said, uh, I tried to call this pastor into accountability. And a board meeting was called. And during the course of this board meeting, instead of the pastor being asked to leave the church or to step down or to be held accountable for his actions, my friend was asked to pack his bags, be out by Sunday, and never mention anything of this privately or publicly again. And he said as he processed what was going on and as the pastor was actually in the room sitting off in the corner, he realized what likely had happened was the pastor had put the board on notice that if they tried to do anything, then he was going to sue. That may not have been the case, but that seemed like the only likely scenario. And so what happened was the board may have in some sick way thought that they respected God, but they certainly feared the pastor. They feared something other than God. Fearing God does not mean respecting God. Fearing God means you don't mess with God because you understand the consequences if you do. It's the biblical equivalent of don't stick the fork in the electrical socket. And so fear isn't always a bad thing. So why was Jesus rebuking these disciples I don't believe necessarily that he was. I know that's what it looks like he's doing, but it only looks like he's rebuking the disciples if you miss one little word in this question. And that word is only two letters long. So, why are you so afraid? And again, from the moment I started looking at this passage, I was troubled by this question because it did not seem reasonable to say to these fishermen that they should not be afraid of the storm. Again, they had spent their lives on the Sea of Galilee. And I know that they have probably heard stories of men, fishermen or sailors or whoever who had gone out onto the Sea of Galilee and never returned to their families. Other storms like this one had claimed the lives of more than one fisherman. And now they're in the midst of their own terrible storm and their boat is in danger of being sunk. They had reason to be concerned, but it wasn't their fear that Jesus was rebuking. It was the way that they reacted to that fear. Why are you so afraid? That little word so comes from the Greek word huto, which means in this way or in this matter. So literally, Jesus was saying, why have you become afraid in this manner? Or another way of saying it would be, why are you reacting to this situation in this way? Well, how did they react? They panicked. They became angry. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him, saying, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Again, it was more than a question. It was a statement. Now, some have speculated that Jesus was, or that the disciples, rather, had expected that Jesus was going to calm the storm. So they were just waking him up, saying, Aren't you just going to calm this thing? Don't you care if we drown? Aren't you? But I don't think that was the case because there's a verse later on that says they were terrified after Jesus had calmed the storm and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They didn't expect Jesus to calm the storm. They were angry because Jesus wasn't up and frustrated or fearful. Jesus wasn't worried about the situation as they were. And they were mad at Jesus because he wasn't in the pit, so to speak, with them. You ever heard the term, misery loves company? It's true. 
when we're fretting and when we're fearful and when we're worried, we don't want somebody to necessarily encourage us out of it. We want somebody to sympathize or empathize with where we're at. We want somebody to be down there with us and angry about what we're angry about or worried about what we're in. I don't know why we do that, but we do. That was never so true in my life as when I was working with alcoholics and drug addicts. The minute an alcoholic messes up or a drug addict messes up, the first thing they want to do is make sure they drag somebody else down into the pit with them. Because misery loves company. And I've been around people who have encountered their own storms in life, and I've seen them react in this way. And I've been there a time or two myself, I'm sure. They'll try to have someone calm the storm or give them a little bit of encouragement. And rather than accept that, they get angry and frustrated with the person who's trying to help. Why were the disciples so angry? What made them lash out at Jesus? Jesus said it was their lack of faith. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now this event was early, according to Mark, it was early in the life of Christ, but Jesus had already performed some miracles. In fact, Mark goes into detail about specific lepers and paralytics and demoniacs that Jesus had touched and healed. And in addition, Mark tells us prior to this that the disciples themselves, if they had faith, if they trusted in Christ, then they too had the power to cast out demons. Jesus had already shown his ability to do amazing things, and he had given them the authority to do these same things. I think the reality is if the disciples had enough faith, they could have spoke to the winds and the waves and calmed the storm. So if they had seen all the power and healing of Jesus, why didn't they just wake him up and say, can you help us out in this storm? Because they hadn't yet learned to look to Jesus for the answers. They hadn't yet learned to ask him for help in the midst of their troubles. And I don't think this storm was by accident. I believe this storm was engineered to teach these men about faith. C.S. Lewis uh, once wrote, You never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death. It's easy to say you believe a rope to be strong enough to hold you, or uh, to be strong as long as you are merely using it to cord a box. But suppose you had to hang by the same rope over a precipice. Wouldn't you then first discover how much you really trusted it. I believe this storm was brought about by God to see how these disciples would react so they could see how they would react. It was designed to see or for them to test whether or not they really trusted God or trusted Jesus. It was designed to push them off the edge of the cliff of their casual relationship with Jesus. It was designed to educate them on something. And I believe that whatever storms we go through in our lives, God can use those struggles. And it's not for his benefit that we enter into these trying times. It doesn't benefit God to see us struggle or to see us go through hardships or to see us experience persecutions, financial problems, marriage problems, It's not for God's benefit, but it can be for our benefit to educate us, to change us, to challenge us, to strengthen our faith in Jesus. And James, in a very familiar passage, tells us that it is for our benefit and that we should consider it joy when we face trials of many kinds because we know that those trials we face, those testings that we face, help us to develop 
perseverance, and perseverance must run its course so that we can be mature or complete, not lacking in anything. It's easy to believe in Jesus when the skies are clear, when everything's going smoothly, but when the storm clouds gather and when the winds blow and beat against our lives, it's then that we have to examine our rope, we have to examine our relationship with Jesus Christ to see how much we really trust him. The disciples, when they were out on the Sea of Galilee, that storm was real. Whether it was orchestrated by God or whether it was just the natural patterns of weather, I don't know, it doesn't really matter in the end, but the storm was real. The storm was a true and frightening experience. And the storm was a real threat to their lives, their families, and their future. It was real. And the fear wasn't the sin. It was how they reacted to that fear. How they responded. They couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't do anything about the storm. And instead of looking to Jesus, they just became angry. They couldn't do anything to change their situation. It would have done them no good to step out of the boat and walk away from it. Ever been there? It just seems like there's no way out of a situation. You can't just step out of it and walk away from it and pretend like nothing happened or pretend like it's all gonna get better. No, there's nothing you can do to get out of the situation. So you have to learn to look to the one who can help you in the situation or through the situation. Whenever I've encountered problems in my life or struggles in my life, and over the past year there have been a few, it's not easy to pack up your family and to move. It's a big financial cost. Uh, My wife is away from her family, and there are some issues, not big issues, but, you know, there's some struggles there when you move 30 hours away from your mom and dad for the first time. There are some storms there. We don't um, have our own place to live. We live in the basement with my sister, and everybody I tell that, they're kind of like, ooh, that's, mm." and I'm like, no, we praise God that My sister and I have a great relationship uh, that is good enough to get us through and so that we can live under the same roof right now. But it's a storm. It's a struggle. But we get through. And if our house is taken away from us, it doesn't matter because through my life and through my walk with God, I have come to the realization that even if I can't do anything to change the circumstances of my life, There is one who is with me who will get me through. And right now I can say with all boldness and confidence in my life that it doesn't matter what happens to me right now, that I trust God that he is sovereign over my life. I trust God that he will get me through whatever this world throws at me. I trust God that as, even as he reveals the things in my life, as Murdoch was saying this morning, the things in my life that I need to change, it's not a physical or thing that's attacking me, it's just a spiritual battle and I'm beating myself up over it and I want so bad to change it that even through those trials or those struggles, God is there with me. Jesus promised the disciples just before he left this earth in that great commission, he ended the great commission said, And I go with you even to the end of the age. I will be with you. That's a promise that I'm standing on. The men weren't in a boat alone. Jesus was there. And in fact, you could say that's why Jesus was there. He was there to deal with the storm that they couldn't handle on their own. For this storm... They had Jesus. Some years ago, there was an uh, evangelic meeting and a speaker was explaining um, what it means to abide in Christ and to trust in Christ completely in trials. In concluding his message, he repeated the same phrase several times. He said, trusting Jesus in your trials means that in every circumstance, you can keep on saying, for this, I had Jesus. And, and, And that 
phrase he repeated over and over, for this I have Jesus, for this I have Jesus. And at the end of the meeting, there was a lady who was sitting at the piano and there was a time opened up for, for, for testimony and the lady stood up immediately and he, she said, I was handed during the message this telegram and when I read it, I knew that this message was for me. And on the telegram she read, mother is very ill, take train home immediately. And she said, as I read that, I knew the pastor's words, for this I have Jesus were meant just for me. Because when I repeated those words, my heart looked up and said, for this I have Jesus. And instantly a peace and a strength came over my soul. And after pausing for a moment, she continued saying, you know, I've never traveled alone. But for this, I have Jesus. And all the stress and all the suspense that goes along with an illness of my, the illness of my mother, I know that for this too, I have Jesus. At the beginning of this message, I told you about an ancient map that is on display in the British Museum in London. Before the map made its way to the British Museum, however, it was in the possession of British explorer by the name of Sir John Franklin in the 1800s. And in spite of the value of this map that dated back to the 1500s, Sir John Franklin was offended by the fear of the ancient mariners. And he scratched out those inscriptions and, in, inscriptions, and in the place where the phrases had once read, here be giants, here be fiery scorpions, here be dragons, he wrote these words across the map. Here is God. Fear is a real emotion. It's often written on the hearts of many in this world. And it's often written on our hearts but when we can scratch out the fear and replace that with the statement, here is God, that's when our faith grows the strongest. That's when we are best able to reflect Christ in this world and to show the world around us that for this, I have Jesus. For this, we have Jesus. So in this new year, realizing that this isn't technically the first Sunday of the new year, but it's kind of the first one where we're really getting back into the swing of things. For this year, no matter what you go through individually, as a family, or no matter what God brings us through as a church, we turn to Christ as the one who can get us through and who will get us through. We don't have to be angry. We don't have to be frustrated because God is right there with us. It's a promise of Scripture. And I am with you.